Up next, Group 5, 1964-73 FIA Manufacturer Championship. And some of the best known sports cars ever raced. And a great combination here with Johannes van Overbeek in pole position in the Ferrari 312 PB. And alongside him, Cameron Healy in the Porsche 908. Alex McAllister in the Ford GT40, the classic, and Michael Reichel in the Chevron. Then the Lotus 23 of Matt Polk, Dave Hagen alongside him in the Porsche 910. Chris McAllister in a 917, Joe Calera in a March 73S. Then row five, Travis Engel in a Lotus 23 and Donald Anderson in a Bobsy Porsche. From Ohio, Dennis Bignone in a Mark II Delu and Chip Fudge in a Bazzarini from Italy. And Gunnar Jeanette in another GT40 Mark I and Dominic Dobson in a Cooper. And on row eight, Gare Ramleth in the Lotus 23, a car that raced in the World Sports Car Championship to success at Monza and Silverstone. Uh, I mentioned the 917 there, but there's several others I'd like to point out as we go for a rolling start here at Sonoma Speed Festival. And we'll keep you up to date. And uh, Johannes van Overbeek. That's what I like about this. You've got people like Johannes van Overbeek who uh, are pretty handy in any kind of car. But I suppose you need to be a pretty good driver to be able to drive any of these particular cars. Well, I think you need to be a pretty good driver. Absolutely. Absolutely these, yeah. uh, with this kind of power, uh, no question about it. And it's a tricky track. So. Yeah, I was talking to Johannes earlier. And of course, he's well known around these parts, as they say and leading the way in that number 87 at the moment. And uh, yeah, he's another one of the, the drivers who's really enjoyed just getting around and, and seeing some of the other cars, never mind what he's driven in the past. Cameron Healy right on his tail in uh, the number 20, and then Alex McAllister, Michael Rich, and David Hagen. Now, Dave Hagen's had a, a brutal day of it. He's had a couple of spins. He had one yesterday in the Formula One, and uh, he's out there again but uh, let's hope he has a, a better time of it. But um, let me ask you this, how do you go about picking? I mean, you've got so many priceless and brilliant cars here, including this GT40, but how do you go about A, picking the groups, and B, picking the particular cars that will definitely bring the aficionados, the guys, the guys that know their cars? Well, first we picked the groups, we just uh, decided you know, what we thought would be terrific. Uh, some of it was because it's the uh, 50th anniversary of the track and of, and of uh, the Mark Donahue's Trans Am win here, so that one was pretty easy. Uh, but then we just picked the groups that we thought would be interesting, and we didn't want to have more than 10 run, 10 run groups. So we've left a lot of people out, uh, on, uh, but um, but we'll rotate them every year. Yeah, and I think people are getting a live stream version of this, so they get a chance to see what it's like. And I think, I think uh, the way you've laid out the paddock and uh, the way you've laid out uh, the wine and the food, that's the other part of it. You wanted to make it more of a, of a festival. Uh, and no better place to plonk it than right in the middle of the Napa Valley almost. Uh, but right by the Sonoma, some of the world's finest wines here. And that really adds to it, surely. It really does. And uh, being in my country, I think, was part of a draw. Um, but getting back to your question on the race groups, I want to—I got to mention Steve Earle, who was really yes. the grandfather of vintage car racing, and we were so fortunate to be able to bring him back uh, into it, and he's been instrumental in picking these groups because we started with 350 entries, uh, we picked 200 cars, uh, and we curated the grids, uh, so you, we, we see cars that would have raced together. Period. Yeah, and I mean, every car, every driver has a story. I'm thinking of uh, the man we've just been watching, Gunnar Jeanette, in the GT40. He was telling me about that 66 GT40 just flashing by there. Um, but it was actually a, a car that wasn't a factory Ford car. It, uh, they had the Ford factory team had one of their GT40s crash out. There weren't that many prepared to go racing. And, of course, Golf were the big sponsor in the day. Uh, and it was the, I think, the president or the vice president of Gulf Oil who had a GT40 and said, well, I got one. Do you want to prepare it for the race? And, and that's what you're looking at here. And Jackie Hicks, in the, in the hands of Jackie Hicks, it was successful, I think, at Daytona and Sebring. So I think a sixth place at Daytona, so not bad. Well, having these two iconic GT40s at our race is absolutely spectacular. And, I, I, of course, I've got to do a shout-out to uh, Miles Collier uh, and the team at the collection in uh, Naples, Florida. Well, I was very fortunate to, uh, and just made me think of it, uh, speak uh, back in the day to Chris Amon, sadly passed away recently, but of course, in his hands, uh, the GT40 took victory in uh, Le Mans, and a, a fantastic day for Ford, and uh, certainly for motor racing. And, and I think that's another part of, of what's so special about this, is we've seen the history of how Europe 
uh, and America came to be, and then how America came back at Europe, basically beating them at their own game and continuing to do so in many, many forms of racing. Uh, and I think that's, it's great to be able to see that uh, both in action um, but also the history of, of how you see those hybrid. I love the fact that uh, John Moak was saying, oh, I've got a hybrid Allard here. And I said, like, what do you mean a hybrid? And he goes, well, it, uh, it's, got a, it's, a, it's an English chassis, but it's got a, a big old V8 engine in it from America. <laughs> those are great. Those are beautiful cars. And I think showcasing the, the war between Ferrari and Ford you know, yeah. is really exceptional as well. Yeah, no question about it. And I think that really did spark uh, the American interest and, and the world's interest in American racing and vice versa. And I think that's uh, why the popularity of American racing grew so quickly uh, in the 60s. And, and I haven't really given as much thought as I've learned this weekend about how when you think about the post-war time of racing, the Americans had probably more steel to build cars and rebuild cars, but they'll probably have a little bit more money in their pockets as well. And I think that's why the likes of Jaguar and then in the 70s, the, the, the Japanese manufacturers were interested in, in starting to export because they realized that this was as good a market as any. Uh, and I think, uh, I think it was Mark Sutton was saying it was so nice to see how the Americans have loved and preserved these race cars. The sun doesn't do any harm, but um, you really do love racing cars from all over the world here in America. We do. I mean, but, uh, you know, in England, uh, this sport is fantastic, too, yeah, and, yeah. and Australia. So what we're trying to do here is just bring back a little bit of that charm, bring back the history, some nostalgia, uh, and, uh, and then just the curating of these cars. Now, while I've got you here, we're watching these uh, fantastic sports cars, uh, FIA manufacturer sports cars from the early 70s. But tell me about some of the other special cars. You drove a birdcage car and you also drove uh, the GTO Ferrari. Tell us tell us about, if you will, because uh, I know there'll be sitting, people sitting out there who probably watch historic racing a lot, but just pinpoint some of the special cars that either demoed here or raced here this weekend. Well, we've had a lot of great cars and uh, I've been fortunate enough to drive a couple of them. One is the uh, GT40 owned by Tom Price, who was kind enough to let me run it. And uh, it is such an extraordinary car. I think everybody knows they only made 36 of them. Um, they really are racing legends. Um, uh, and to have it on track, actually to have two of them on track, to have the uh, McNeil car on track as well is incredibly special. Uh, out of the 36, it is, pr it is for sure the most original one in the world. So. To have two of them here uh, is just extraordinary, and and I think that's one of the things that will help our, you know, help spectators uh, appreciate uh, the history. Uh, the second car I drove was a Maserati Birdcage 1960 called the Tipo 61. Uh, at the time, the technology uh, in terms of frame building was really extraordinary. And that's how it got its name. It looks almost like a nest, doesn't it? Exactly. It's, it, it is, it, the idea was to create a, a, a nest-like, birdcage-like uh, frame that was both lightweight but sturdy, yeah? And that's exactly right. The, um, the frame, if you take everything off of it, actually weighs about 165 pounds. Oh, wow. So um, it's quite incredible that one person can pick it up. I think that's another thing that uh, has been remarkable for me, anyway, this uh, weekend, is to learn how light some of these the, the these cars that we're watching, but uh, some of the lightweight cars, how they were able to compete with much bigger uh, displacement uh, and heavier cars. And, and a Sonoma circuit is a good example. It, it, there isn't a straight where these cars are just going to take off. So actually, if you can be nimble, if you know what you're doing behind the wheel, um, you, you can make some pace. Well, that's exactly right. And uh, Jonathan, it brings me back to kind of the, one of the things we're trying to showcase here is uh, the evolution of speed. So we have everything from 1911, uh, Mercer all the way up to the, the 2016 uh, Lewis Hamilton car. And you talk about removing weight. I mean, it was everything from magnesium back in the 30s um, uh, uh, to carbon fiber today. So it's, it's really incredible uh, the way the uh, cars have developed. And, and I hope, you know, one of the things that people walk away with, they say, wow, that was, I realized that was technologically advanced in the day. And today, you know, here's where it's gone to. And that's the beauty, I've been saying this all weekend, that's the beauty of our sport is it's not like any other sport in the world. Um, you can't, yes, these are museum pieces, but we race them. <laughs> we don't just leave them behind a glass case. Now, there is places where that does happen, but not here. Not here, not here. And I am so grateful that our uh, drivers uh, and car owners are gracious and want to share them. And I think pe people cannot totally appreciate a static car. Once they've seen 
uh, these vehicles, seen them at speed, watched them, heard them, smelled the exhaust. Uh, it's just part of history. And uh, I just think, you know, I'm just very grateful that, our, that, that these drivers are willing to bring out these amazing special cars. Because one of the unique things we've done is every car here is original. That's quite a feat in itself, really. With race history as well. Yeah, that, that I think is, and, and, and long may that continue, because I do know that uh, people will occasionally bend the rules or say, oh, well, this is, you know, it's, it's sort of this or it's sort of that. These are all originals. Yeah, we've done, we've gone with only originals. We think we want to stay that course. Um, you know, we, we understand that every time somebody runs a race that they have probably, you know, depreciated it slightly, but but I think the, the return is that the public gets to share see these amazing automobiles so I think it's well worth it part of our, one of our other goals is to teach young people about preservation and restoration and that tell me about that that's the RPM Institute yeah there's the RPM uh, foundation which is a restoration preservation and mentorship so we create we we are a part of you know helping them bring visibility to the organization and they give grants out to students that are interested in preservation and restoration now I know you got to go you got to wave a flag drive a car Greet some people. I know you got to. You cannot be not doing anything. So I've had you up here for quite long enough. Last two questions. Um, what's your vision for the future? What would you like to see different next year? You've got. Uh, I know you want to do it again and again. And everybody that I've spoke to said they want to come back next year. So that's a that's a that's one tick in the box. Well, but what, what would you like to see? What would you like to? Well, look. I, I I think it's about a curated collection of not only race cars but of museums. I mean, one of our goals here was to bring a different museum every year and showcase whether it's car design or style or what have you. So we'll have period cars. I mean, this year we were fortunate enough to have W196 from the Indianapolis Museum and uh, the Lotus, uh, the Jim Clark Lotus at one Indianapolis. So I think if we look to the future, it'll be about how do we continue to bring amazing cars and collections to the track. And I've had a number of people call me and say, you know, I've got a long list of things that you can improve here. And hey, if you're in the Bay Area and you don't have, a, you don't even like cars, it doesn't matter. We've got great wine, we've got great food, and a good festival atmosphere. And that's exactly what this is all about. Jeff O'Neill, thank you so much Terrific. for coming up. Thank and, you, Jonathan. Uh, best of luck in the rest it. of the day. Thank you. Don't drive any more cars. Just relax. Have a glass of wine. <laughs> So we're in the middle of this, and Johannes van Overbeek. I'm actually delighted that Jeff O'Neill has brought me one of my good friends here. And that, of course, is Howden Ganley, an actual racing driver from the period, I may add. And I mean that in the most possibly polite way. Howden Ganley, a Formula One driver from New Zealand, who went on his way and competed against the very best of motor racing and uh, delighted. Uh, finally, I've, I've spoken to a lot of really special folks, but I've not spoken to a proper driver from the proper era. How are you, Hank? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing very well. I'd, uh, I'd heard your voice and I thought, I know that, <laughs> I know that guy. <laughs> and I've got to go find him. And he, here we are. Yeah, this is just a phenomenal event, isn't it? Oh, it's, uh, it's absolutely superb. And I know, now I know you're here, that this would be right up your alley. I know you live down the road, but uh, you, you, you've lived most of this. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of familiar cars here. Um, unfortunately, I never got to race a GT40. Lovely to have those here. You had a few mates that did. Well, I, I was a mechanic uh, on them uh, when I was trying to get some money together. And I think you were discussing uh, golf. Uh, Grady yep. Davis was the vice president ah, who, okay. who owned one. Uh, and these are the original golf company colours. Yes. When they went racing, if you remember, they turned the dark blue into a light blue. Well, why did they change it, it to the light blue? John Wire thought that the light blue would be a lot nicer. Well, and I, I think, think it was think a good was right. decision. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're still resplendent in these colours, but this is the original, right? Yes, and so then when they really got going, you know, the 917s that were out earlier, they are obviously in the light blue and orange colour. It's quite catching. And as a Kiwi, or certainly uh, a man who knows that history all too well, why was that significant win in 66 so important for both Bruce and uh, to Chris Amon? Well, it showed us that, uh, you know, Kiwis can win anywhere. That's true, and, and they still are. Uh, Scott, our Scott Dixon won here last year. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and so it was a, a big feather in both of the camps, particularly for Chris, because yeah. that attracted Ferrari's attention. So, you know, 67, Chris is junior driver at Ferrari, and then sadly because of Bandini and the other guys, pretty soon he's the number one driver at Ferrari. Had a wonderful career there.
and won the long distance races for them as well, even though sadly he didn't ever win a Grand Prix for them. Now, Howard, we met, uh, Howard, we met at um, the Legends of Speed back in New Zealand and I got to know your history there. Why don't you let the folks know at home um, how you got uh, effectively off New Zealand and, and went racing? Because your story is a classic story of, you know, hey, I'm just going to give it a go. Like you said, you started as a mechanic and made it all the way to Formula 1. Yeah, well, I started racing in New Zealand. I managed to scratch up enough money to buy Lotus 11. And I, I thought I did reasonably well, probably other people sort of didn't, but anyway. Uh, but I thought I needed to swim in a much bigger pond, so I managed to get myself to England. I only had £25, not the $35 today, uh, <laughs> left when I got there. But uh, I then had to drop back and be a mechanic to try and get some money together. And then Bruce McLaren, he was the catalyst, because I got my way to the top of Formula 3, but then where do I go from there? And uh, after the last race of the season, a couple of weeks later, I get a phone call from Bruce McLaren. Come to Goodwood for a Formula 1 test. And then that led on to fight the Works 5000. Well, you must have known what you were doing, or he must have thought you knew what you were doing. I mean, he, it's not many mechanics that get asked to come and test the car. <laughs> no, well, uh, you know, I'd gone really well in Formula 3. Right. I finally got the money together. And I set the first ever, or the only ever, 100 mile an hour lap uh, at Brands Hatch. And of course it was all over the magazines and everything and mm -hmm. so Bruce must have thought, well, okay, here's a Kiwi who can maybe drive a wee bit. And uh, so the plan was I was going to take his place in the Formula One team at the end of the year, but sadly he was killed mm. during the year. And, but I went to BRM anyway. And how was that? We've had uh, we've had some 70s and 80s versions of uh, March, BM, uh, BRM and um, uh, Lotus here, but uh, how were those days uh, racing for them? Well, I only drove for March briefly. I was their test driver for a long time. Uh, I was the first guy ever to test a Formula One March before Chris and uh, Siffin and everybody. Um, and uh, then I drove for them in 74 in the orange car that was racing earlier yes. on, uh, Martin Lauber car. Mm -hmm. uh, I drove the sister car. There were two, two of those built and I drove for them in, in that particular car. And, yeah, I, you know, they were... They had a what seemed like a lot of horsepower. It was only about 450 horsepower. It's today it's not, not a whole lot, <laughs> but the tyres weren't as good as they are. And uh, so, yeah, I had a wonderful time. I did uh, 41 uh, World Championship Grand Prix. I did 20 non-championship Grand Prix, and then finished second at Le Mans because I did sports cars. And so, very lucky. Well, as we look at sports cars, how was it to actually race in the day, as it were, uh, at Le Mans, where... By then, the, the Molzar straight was infamous back then and getting speeds of over 230, 240 miles an hour at times. Uh, what was it like to race uh, Le Mans back in uh, those days? In the 70s, yeah. Well, I drove for Matra the first year, but you know, they were only three-litre engines in those days, so they only just did a bit over 200. They were, oh, they, yeah. Uh, <laughs> they were, and the, but they didn't have any chicanes in the straight. Right. The straight. And there would only two, be two drivers. I drove with Francois Sabair. Uh, but, uh, a uh, handy driver. Matra wanted only Formula One drivers for the three cars. So, yeah, it was a, a great time. And then uh, when they told all the non-Frenchmen that they couldn't have a drive the following year, I went to golf and drove for, for golf in the, in the blue and orange car, the Mirage. Unfortunately, no, uh, there are none here. Uh, you know, they were racing at the same time as the Ferrari... PBs, but um, I don't know where they all are. Well, in your long career, would you say, is there a car that you missed out on that you really wanted to get your hands on and, and perhaps didn't, or maybe didn't wait until you retired and, and, and just gave one a spin, or is there is there something you still would like to drive? One of the greatest cars I ever drove, uh, I, because I said I was driving for Mantra in, at Le Mans, and I had permission from BRM who was driving for Formula One to drive the Matra. And just before Monaco Grand Prix in 72, I got a call from Chris Amon, who was their number one, at that, that point their sure. only driver. Could I go to Rickard and test his car? Because he was, I don't know what, for some reason he couldn't do it. So he flew me down on his plane. I spent a whole day driving the Matra Formula One car. And I tell you, Jonathan, that was magic. Really? Absolutely magic car. Why? Just because of the design and because yes. of the power to weight Stiff ratio? Stiff chassis and, so and the lovely V12 engine. Mm. And uh, 
So I thought that's very nice. Of course, I, you know, then I, a couple of days later at Monaco at the BRM, which wasn't nearly as nice. <laughs> and, uh, oh, about a month later, I get a phone call. Patrick, can you get out of your BRM contract? And there's a space at Matra. And could I get out of my BRM contract? Could, no, way, no way, no <laughs> way. <laughs> no, I couldn't. So that's kind of like one that got away. Brilliant. Yes, I can well imagine. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. What do you think of Sonoma as a track? Like you say, you're a local man now. Um, so um, what do you think? Uh, is it, it looks like it's a really tough track to do historic racing at. And all the drivers I've spoken said it's quite a challenge. Yeah, well, because I didn't ever race here, it was closed down in a uh, short sure. time, wasn't it? Uh, my wife had raced here. And I took, I was very sensibly, but the only smart thing I've ever done in my life, I married a beautiful little California girl from out here. That is smart. And uh, she had done a lot of racing. Um, oh, here we are. Here's the car with the original golf yes, colours. Yeah. The, uh, the light blue and orange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful colour scheme. I think the light blue is much better than the dark blue, but anyway, just... And this is a Pedro Rodriguez car. I'm sure you probably met him in your day. Yes, I did. well, I was teammate with him at BRM in 71. And I'm glad I asked the question. He was killed <laughs> in the middle of the season. Um, but yes, we, then when I retired from racing, I started building race cars. And this was our biggest single market place, was the Bay Area here. So we came a number of times, and then customers asked me to do a few laps in their car. So I've driven it, and uh, it's, it is a really great track. Yes, it does look so, and I, and I also like the, the concept that, uh, that Jeff's putting together here, which is a very friendly atmosphere, a very festival kind of Goodwood feel to it, um, with all the wine and, and food, and also the inclusivity, you know, getting involved in it, getting amongst the cars, and not having them hidden away, and not touchable, I, li I like that, and these are priceless cars. Yeah, that's a great thing about actually, uh, most historic festivals, and, and certainly here, is that you can stand beside the car, you can feel it, touch it. Even mm -hmm. like a Grand Prix today, you know, you're half a mile away, you can't get near you should say you can't get near them. Uh, and I think Jeff's concept is absolutely wonderful, that he's got original cars, they're not made up things, uh, genuine things, I know Steve Earl's very good on that. And the, the grass and the wick, you know, the fences and all of that, the marquees, it's kind of like Goodwood Revival has come yes. to see his point. <laughs> it is. I, think, I think it's just wonderful. I think that's exactly the concept. You're listening to the words of Howden Ganley, who is a good friend of mine uh, from New Zealand, but now living here in California. Although he never li lives in one place more than uh, half a week or two. He travels more than anybody I know. Um, but uh, he is a absolute aficionado of racing a former formula one star in his own right and has driven many of these cars and that's why i'm so excited to have him because it's so nice to actually talk to somebody who you know it's great to talk to these <laughs> talk to these guys uh, and uh, who are very handy that's alex uh, McAllister just getting out of shape there as he chases gunner jeanette down who in his own right is a very good imsa driver so we've got some very good peddlers and uh, johannes van overbeek just retired from sports car racing here in the states and Hannon, who are you looking at i was looking at the bottom dominic dobson yep indy car driver yes and he was my uh, tiger dealer here uh, on the west coast based here uh, at the track one of the workshops oh perfect Zephyr, Zephyr racing there and you go. So i was just talking to him he's driving this ex bruce mclaren uh, cooper monaco but with the, the automobile engine Oh, he's in 15th place at the moment. Come on, Dominic, hurry up. Hurry up, <laughs> get it going. <laughs> so have you had a wander around? I have been here all three days. Uh, initially, I thought I was just coming on Friday, and then so good I came back yesterday, and then I thought it was so good I came back again today. Well, there, that's, to be honest, that's the, that's the probably the, the, the greatest compliment they can get, because you've been, I mean, without being rude, you, you've probably seen enough of race cars in your own, whole life where you don't need to see another one, but <laughs> if, it, if it sparks your interest enough to, to, to be here, and uh, we're delighted to have you, um, I, I, I'm long may that continue, that's great. Yeah, I, I just love this whole uh, thing, and I love all these cars. I suppose I'm, you know, I'm still a bit of a groupie. I can't stay away. I got a question for you. I've been mentioning when I've been watching sports cars, we had a, 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 saw a sort of a Group 9 more modern version than these sports cars. But when you're class racing, like at Le Mans, 
And, and here's a good example, watching the number 21, 917, who's got obviously a lot more power than the others. How hard is it to come up on a slower car, make them aware you're, aware you're there, and choose your moment to do just this, which is overtake cleanly uh, and without fuss to the car, both behind and in front. Like, here's a good example. They're side by side now, and if you cut across, they would touch. And, uh, it's not a, that, that's an art in itself, isn't it? It, it, one of the biggest single problems, yeah, if you're in a really fast car, you know, the, the smaller engine cars, they're having their own race, and mm -hmm. so they're probably worrying about who they're racing with, and then you're coming up on them at some enormous speed. I think I probably annoyed everybody at the moment, because I used to get on the big headlights and we sure. flashing them all the way <laughs> coming up. But I did get caught out. I got uh, at Balalunga in the World Championship sports car race. I got punted into the guardrail by a guy. As I came to lap him, I thought he'd seen me. I was, he was wandering around the middle of the road, presumably lost, and I just went down the left end. So I, he just turned left straight into me, poof. And uh, the other one, which is uh, a story I've told, and the Spa, the Master King. Ooh, oh, the GT40. Oh no, McAllister having a is massive that, off there. That's at the carousel. Is that and Chris? That's McAllister, yeah. So he had a moment earlier where he got a little squirrely, but that was, uh, that's probably one of the biggest offs I've seen all weekend. And it's in a priceless car at that. I love it. But I tell you what, they're pushing on. And I, 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 I've yeah. now got a, a proper judge. These guys aren't, aren't uh, holding back, are they? No, it looks like everybody's trying pretty hard here. Um, yeah, Chris, uh, Chris has got some wonderful cars. Well, hang on, what's that Chris? He's, he's, still, he's still being... Oh, no, that was Alex McAllister, excuse me, oh, in the number nine. Yeah, you've got Chris McAllister also, just behind him in the 21. Yeah, right. He's yeah. in the 917. Chris, Chris and, and his son are both the, the, in the same race. Yeah. yeah. It's a nice little car, that number 37. The Porsche, Dave Hagen at the wheel, and here's the 87. Yeah, no, yeah these Ferraris were brilliant, weren't they? They, they dominated the uh, World Championship in uh, 72, didn't they? Yeah. And uh, then, of course, the mattress came along and they were a bit quicker, but still the Ferraris are a wonderful car in that flat 12 oh. Formula 1 engine. Oh, we've got at least one GT40. Oh, that's the same one. He's, he's, back, he's back and going again. This is the final lap of this race, and uh, I think it's been a fantastic uh, race. And I love the fact that they're not demoing these cars. They're not just going around and, and, and after you, sir, after you. They are racing. Yeah, but, and also, Jonathan, I'm not seeing people running into each other, nope. which is good. Well, a, a hard touch racing. wood, there's one more to go. <laughs> <laughs> but I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, it's great. I, I'm really pleased to see uh, the skill actually involved uh, because you do have um, quite a contrast of drivers. Some guys have only ever driven historics. Others are not like yourself, uh, you know, been professional racing drivers who now continue to, to pedal around in a, in a, in a uh, you know, uh, an historic car. And others uh, are out and out race drivers who are just doing this uh, as, a, as a bit of fun. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, well, uh, you know, some of the historic festivals we go to, there, there is quite a lot of body contact, but I'm not seeing any of that here. So they're racing hard and fast and, and, and not making mistakes. I think that was, oh, oh, well, well, as, as we say that, that Gunnar Jeanette gets it wrong. So he's well, he's got a reverse gear. He hasn't got well, it's all going on. Group nine. Or group five. Uh, sorry, group... Uh, oh, well, I've lost my groups. I'm all excited. This is the battle for second place, and it's going all the way to the wire. The 91 on the inside. Here we go. And he's just got him. And Joe Kaleo just trying to see if he can come back at him, but he can't. And across the line they come. And that was uh, Cameron Healy, uh, Johannes van Overbeek, already a winner. And sadly, we've had one spinner in the number nine. That's uh, McAllister, Alex, getting uh, out of shape. And now Gunnar, Jeanette has just, uh, well, I think he's either got a, a, a got it stuck in gear, but it's come to a stop either way. But it doesn't look as though there's any damage, which is always good, look, good news. Howden Ganley alongside me, enjoying this. And uh, always nice to get a perspective from somebody who raced uh, these cars when they were race cars and not just history pieces. And uh, is there anything that surprised you that you didn't 
expect to see here because like I was saying to, to Jeff, there's some amazing cars here. The, yes, he, hasn't he done so well collecting yeah. such great cars? Um, and the fact that you're not seeing any made up. You know, unfortunately in the historic world, you have got a bit of uh, non-originality crept in, but he's been really good. Yeah, he said that all the original cars, making yeah. proper, getting proper cars. And I think that when you're setting out to, to do something like this, that really does make a big difference. Um, because, uh, like you say, there are people who will put on a show and say that's a, a GT40, and it isn't. Or it's got bits and bobs, and so they claim, you know, and then um, yes. it really isn't. And so uh, these, like the 917s, there's a lot of those around. And, of course, uh, we all saw the film Le Mans, and uh, it's great to see original cars like this being raced. And also, all the way down to the tyres used, they make sure that they are all in period, so that if you wanted to run the latest Dunlop spec tyres to get a little bit more sticky, you can't. Uh, or, uh, you know, you've got to run whatever was run on the car that you were in, or the championship at least that you were in. And so that includes Dunlop and Blockley and names that you may not have heard of. Uh, uh, Blockley, yes. Yeah. Well, there's a famous tyre. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So Chris McAllister's finished up third there. Good. Plenty of highlights from that one as they got away and away went the Ferrari early on and everybody chasing him down including, it looks as though one of the GT40s having to come from the back but what that he did and uh, swooping around, getting through the smaller cars and trying to make his way through the traffic in the number 11 this is Gunnar Jeanette I'm talking about and then uh, some more action all the way through and everybody enjoying their afternoon out I'm sure likewise Joe Kaleo who's had a big weekend the Australian he's been uh, he's in been about three cars I think this weekend so uh, it's gonna be a you know, he'll enjoy his night off tonight I would have thought <laughs> a moment of uh, oh, craziness yeah. through the carousel well there you go it shows you they were pushing and that was the number nine of Alex McAllister, and then right at the end there, a battle for second place all the way to the line. But it's the Ferrari who wins in the hands of the number 87, Johannes van Overbeek. Well done to him, and my thanks to Howard and Ganley. Joining me here in the beautiful sunshine, slightly breezy sunshine of California here in the Sonoma Hills.